Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for this uh, breakout session on Africa's just transition in practice. My name is Nabila Abudeman, and I'm a manager in social issues here at the PRI, and I will be your moderator today. A key pillar of the 2015 Paris Agreement, um, the concept of a just transition is now entrenched in sustainable development and climate fora. It, it really weds social inclusion with climate action to ensure that the shift to a resilient zero carbon economy is fair and that it puts people at its heart. In fact, a just transition is a precondition to successful climate action because without the buy-in of all stakeholders, including workers and communities, there will be pushback. In other words, a just transition requires that the transformational change to low carbon economies in response to the climate crisis is designed and is carried out without leaving anyone behind. And social considerations cannot be an add-on simply to climate action. And this is particularly true in the African context where addressing existing high levels of unemployment, poverty and inequality is a, if not the priority. And there are risks of replicating or intensifying poverty and inequality through processes of transformation. But there are also opportunities for more equitable societal outcomes. Achieving this critical agenda in, in, in time and in light of the added complexity brought in by the COVID crisis requires a whole of economy response, which includes private sector action alongside government policies. And in their role as long-term stewards of capital, the case for investor action is clear. Over the past couple of years, we've seen investor awareness and action to support the just transition really grow. Now more than 160 investors with $10 trillion of, dollars of assets under management have signed the PRI investor statement to support the just transition agenda. So to discuss how the implication of the just transition agenda translate in the African context and the role that investors can play in driving a just transition, I'm really pleased to be joined today by our panel of experts, namely David Coldridge, who's head of ESG engagement at 91, Jesse Burton, senior associate at E3G, Dr. Maciej Bukowski, CEO of Wise Europa, and Enda Kize, chief investment officer of EPPF. So to kick us off, I'd like to turn to you, Jesse, to speak us through what the just transition means in the African context, what have been some of the recent developments that we've observed in the continent and the main challenges that the process poses. So without further ado, Jesse, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nabila. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. So I wanna start briefly by just talking a little bit more through what, what is just transition because it's become a very popular term. People use it frequently, but I'm not sure that actually everybody really knows what they're talking about. It becomes apparent everyone has a different idea about what it means. Um, and the concept originated in the labor movement where it was really concerned about workforce transitions related to industrial closures. But over recent years, you know, as it's, as it's become more mainstream, as the ILO has adopted principles and it's been included in the Paris Agreement, um, it's become broader and it's, it's really about making explicit that the transition to a low carbon economy and society has to include social and economic restructuring. And that social and economic restructuring has to alter the existing patterns of inequality, poverty, and vulnerability in, in economies, both for fossil fuel communities and regions, for people who already depend on fossil fuels and might lose their livelihoods as we phase them out, but also much more broadly for people who are excluded from, from, from economies already today. And I think there, especially as more developing um, countries start to use this concept, it becomes much more closely aligned with how to do good development. So at its core, really, um, the term refers to an integrated approach to sustainable development, and it brings together social progress, environmental protection, and economic success. Um, and in this framework, it's also about democratic governance um, and procedural justice, so people being allowed to make decisions about their lives as well. So effective just transition strategies have local bottom-up participation of affected communities, workers, um, commitments by government who will guarantee uh, long-term planning capacity and legitimacy to processes. And I think also importantly, an international element. 
So those who have been responsible, especially for, for climate impacts and which impact the developing world more, need to support countries and regions who are now having to transition away from fossil fuels on accelerated timelines faster than has ever been done before. Now, um, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, has a set of, of guidelines which have been agreed to by governments, unions and, and, and companies, which just says a just transition towards an environmentally sustainable economy needs to be well managed and contribute to the goals of decent work, social inclusion and the eradication of poverty. So poverty eradication and environmental sustainability are really two of the defining challenges of the century. Um, and as we start to transition away from fossil fuels in particular and, and kind of transform economies in their entirety, really, it's about everything when you're talking about net zero and, and ambitious cl climate action. Um, how do we do that in a way that that is good for, for, for people? So greening economies, of course, comes with all sorts of opportunities to achieve these social objectives. Um, it can be an engine of growth. Um, it can be a net generator of decent green jobs. And of course, we can also build on social safety nets for, for, for people who for whom there isn't enough growth, right? And in each country, this will be different, right? So the guidelines state that countries need to have their own economic, environmental, social, labor, industrial, education, and training policies that will match the resources and the state of development and the level of industrialization in different places. Um, so each country kind of has to find its way through that transition and it will depend very much. Are you oil dependent, gas dependent, coal dependent? Is this about transport? Is this about changing your manufacturing exports? And so there needs to be these kind of processes and social dialogues internally to, to, to guide that. What does this mean in Africa and South Africa, I guess, is the next question. So clearly socioeconomic challenges are extremely prevalent. Unemployment or underemployment uh, is a big issue across the entire continent, especially youth unemployment, and, and of course the difficulties faced by women in particular in, in, in accessing work. South Africa is a good example of this. Um, we were already at 39% unemployment before COVID, um, and that's now well over 40%. Um, finding a solution to people who cannot find work is, is integral to, to, to building a better society. Um, a second part of this that's very pertinent for Africa is, is around access to modern energy services. So globally, 770 million people lack access to electricity last year, and 2.6 billion lacked access to clean cooking. Now, that's obviously not all in Africa, but because of COVID, as people are starting to fall back into poverty, the IEA estimates that this is going to worsen, and, and 10 million people on the continent are going to lose access to electricity. A third part is, a re is related to environmental injustice. Of course, communities who are based next to fossil fuel extraction, uh, to oil and gas extraction, especially coal, are facing all sorts of environmental injustices around pollution, uh, non-compliant power plants, uh, dust, water, blasting, destroying their homes. Uh, and people are also often lose their livelihoods where there's fossil fuel extraction and mining. There's also climate impacts, which are disproportionately hitting the people who are less able to, to deal with it. So when there's a lack of social and economic resilience, that means people can't absorb the physical impacts and associated effects, but there's also just very bad physical impacts. South Africa is warming at twice the rate of, of the global average. Um, and, and one of the tricky parts here is that fossil fuel extraction is still viewed by many governments as part of the, the right development pathway to follow. Um, even though there's many decades of work now, right, showing that the resource that countries face resource curses, that the scale of the, the climate challenge that we face, the pace that we need to phase out fossil fuel means that there's such small quantities of fossil fuels that can still be burnt, that those are not really going to drive development in countries that are not yet extract, extracting them. Um, and there's been some very interesting recent work by the IMF that showed that the benefits of oil and gas extraction in Africa over the last 10 years um, were much lower than were expected when they started across different countries. So, so you know, following these, these high fossil, high carbon development pathways, which many governments still see as, a, as an opportunity, really is part of our just transition here is, a, is, a, is around pivoting and leapfrogging away from that. Um, in South Africa, I mean, so, so overall, it really, like, What's clear is that a high carbon development pathway is not just. It doesn't have climate justice, it doesn't have economic justice, it doesn't have environmental justice more broadly. What does this mean in South Africa? So in South Africa in particular, we're the most coal dependent country in the G20. We have um, much greater dependence on coal than almost any other country in the world. 
our climate challenge is primarily a coal challenge, but not solely. So we need to do two things. We need a very focused strategy around existing workers and communities based in Mpumalanga. But not only, we also need to be thinking about the automotive value chain, the liquid fuels value chain. We're already seeing closures at refineries. And like with ESCOM, these closures are starting to happen haphazardly because the infrastructure is collapsing, not because there's a planned transformation, not because there's an electric vehicle strategy um, with a twinned automotive manufacturing strategy. It's just because, you know, the refineries are old and falling apart. They're not... Uh, detailed sets of mechanisms to move workers, to retrain them, reskill them, redeploy them, or find a way to fund them to retire early to protect people's livelihoods. So we do need a very focused strategy around workers and communities, but then we have a bigger challenge. South Africa is the most unequal society in the world. 55% uh, of people live in extreme poverty. Um, we really have to focus on a bigger economic development and transformation agenda. People are very focused on how do we take a coal miner and turn them into a solar worker. But in reality, what countries need is a package of sectoral growth plans in manufacturing, in energy, in agriculture, in agro-processing, developing ecosystem services in tourism, coupled with strong social support for the vulnerable. And that's a just transition plan. Uh, you know, just moving a single worker is very important for those people's lives, and we shouldn't undercount it. But, you know, it's, there's 43% unemployment in Mpumalanga already today. And Mpumalanga needs an industrial plan for the future, um, and that's what's just. And that will also mean bringing in people who have been excluded from, from the, the existing energy economy. So for me, really, just transition... Um, is about making sure that as we move towards a low carbon and climate resilient economy and phase out fossil fuels, we're also building innovative and growing economies that benefit people. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Jesse. Uh, yeah, for, for painting this picture and, and yeah, giving us an idea of, of all the challenges uh, that is facing the continent and, and also giving us some, some possible pathways. Uh, yeah. For, for progress on this agenda. I'd like to, to now turn to, to Ndabe. Um, you're an asset owner in South Africa. And how do you, how do you approach this, this just transition agenda? What motivates your action? How do you navigate all this complexity that, that Jesse just uh, highlighted for us? Um, good morning. Thank, thank you for having me. <clears throat> um, my name is Ndabe Mkize from the ESCOM Pension and Provident Fund. Um, we are indeed um, signatories uh, of PRI and uh, take um, ESG policies uh, seriously. Uh, our focus or view uh, of ESG is very holistic. So we are not just focusing only on the environment, but we see it having interactions with the social aspects and indeed the governance. Um, you're not going to have people with bad governance uh, taking care of the environment or the social uh, dynamics of that in a good way. Um, we are also, uh, being asset owners, uh, our mandate makers. Uh, we can see what we want to uh, take place with our funds and we can be able to talk to asset, um, asset managers um, and be able to direct how they are investing the, that money. Um, when it's all said and done, we are trying to invest our money so that our members have enough money to retire on, uh, but still a good enough world to retire into. Uh, so we have to balance uh, those two competing things. Um, I think uh, COVID-19, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the importance of having to uh, balance two opposing things, uh, be it lives and livelihoods. Uh, in the case of um, COVID-19, it's uh, to keep everyone indoors uh, under lockdown and not working. Um, they don't die of COVID-19, but uh, they could die a slow and painful death of starvation. Um, in the same way, uh, we believe that um, in the countries um, that are still using fossil fuels, especially the developing countries, um, if you uh, quit, if they quit fossil fuel coal Turkey, um, they would be uh, saving lives. There's no more pollution, uh, but they would also be dying a slow death, painful death of starvation. Uh, and uh, we feel that uh, very starkly with an un unemployment rate of close to 40 percent and an, an unofficial one probably of close to 50 to 60 percent, especially in, in some of the uh, poor uh, townships, we cannot afford to be losing any more jobs. 
Um, so it is important that we are able to look at who's polluting and for what reason. Um, when we're talking at companies like uh, Sassel, um, that are a huge employer of people in the Mpumalanga province uh, and Free State, uh, we look at uh, even Sassel, um, the sorry, um, ESCOM, the power utility that uh, supplies electricity mainly from uh, coal-fired uh, power stations. It will be difficult for them to turn that off quickly and start building new things. Even as we are rolling out and ramping up on renewable energy, that is not enough to um, replace the installed um, uh, capacity. So a plan needs to be uh, made um, so that while we care about the environment and we want to do as much as we can about that, we also need to look at the lives that will be um, uh, affected uh, so that we don't have social unrest when people indeed are employed and government has no tax revenue to even pay some of the basic income grants. Um, however, we need management of those companies to be responsible and to have good governance that they can deploy things like um, pollution uh, uh, mitigants so that they're not polluting at a faster rate um, and that they're also doing something to make sure that the future generation does not depend a lot on fossil fuel uh, and then working for companies that are in this space and that's a, an investment in education. But I'll, I'll probably have time to touch on uh, more on that later. So our view uh, and on this is very holistic. Uh, we even have impact investing that talks about how we can invest in things like affordable air education, affordable high quality education, uh, renewable energy, uh, as well as what we're doing with current companies that could be polluters. Um, I, I, I believe that there's a a topic that needs to be addressed by all uh, asset owners and and we know that if you have not put anything in the IPS in the investment policy statement which is um, a framework by which uh, all pension funds especially defined ben uh, benefit pension funds um, manage their investments uh, nothing will be done uh, so for us all of these policies um, the ESG and then even have a, a climate change uh, a policy within that, uh, taking into account the just transition uh, dynamics of that. All of those things need to be housed within uh, a document, uh, within the investment policy statement, so that uh, uh, pension funds can, and, and other asset owners um, will be able to implement those and be able to track uh, and monitor how they are, they are being implemented by the asset um, asset managers. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ndabe, for making yeah, such a compelling case and, and giving us examples of what, as an asset owner, you can you can practically do. So, yeah, turning to to you, David, um, Ndabe talked to us about what asset owners can do and you know how they're mandate makers. But as a as an investment manager, what kind of challenges have you encountered when it comes to the Just Transition Agenda and maybe how do you build that in your engagement with investing companies? Nabila, thank you and uh, good to be with everybody today and I thought Jesse laid a great foundation for how complex it is for asset owners like Ndabe and uh, ourselves as investors uh, to invest into the South African investment environment. Darby makes a great point about the importance of the policy statement in terms of what investment managers should be doing in relation to the um, contract effectively that is being provided by the asset owner. It's quite scary in Darby how few asset owners do exactly what you've said. That one issue could make a huge difference going forward. And I can see Jessie nodding her head there. So let's just go back a bit and let's pick up some of the issues that both Jesse and Darby mentioned. So this is about people. It's quite scary how the investment world has kind of forgotten about people. If we look at what's happened in New Zealand recently, let's hope that the winds of change are blowing and it's not just the gender issue, but it's people as a whole, which are really important. Um, so in Darby put it really well. So we can retire into this world with sufficient money, 
But what about the world we're retiring into? If you've got 42% of your population who are unemployed, can you ever feel comfortable in that situation? No, of course you can't. And maybe you're not safe in some, uh, some particular situations as well. And it's not right. It's not correct. So let's now look at what I was asked to do in terms of really linking this to investment and stewardship. So um, Jesse mentioned about our carbon intensive economy. So about 85% of our energy comes from, uh, from coal. And then if you look at the liquid fuels as well, if you take liquid fuels and you take the generation of electricity, the, they are responsible for nearly 50% of the emissions in South Africa. That is enormous. But what it gives us is clarity about materiality, where it's important to focus resources. Now, it's really difficult with regard to ESCOM, which is the biggest emitter, but we'll come back to that later when we talk about a little bit about collaboration. But SASL was mentioned. And um, in terms of the supply of coal to SASL, Zara is involved there. It, it supplies most of the coal to SASL. And if you look at just one of SASL's plants in Secunda, it employs 22,000 people. Essentially, the town of uh, or s town of Secunda is there because of Sassel. If you wiped out Secunda, which is the single largest emitter in the world, what do you do with regard to the 22,000 people? Clearly, it's a massive issue in terms of what. Jesse Darby and I've just said. And if you look at Zaro, it employs roughly 23,000 people. And if you look at the coal industry as a whole, the coal industry in South Africa employs just over 80,000 people. It's a massive amount of people, probably 20% of the mining industry. So here you have the situation. Now you've got to look for asset classes to invest on behalf of your uh, clients where you've got a mandate that requires you to invest only in South Africa. So you've got this limited investment universe in terms of the equity side. You've got a sovereign that's struggling balance sheet wise, and you've got the state owned entities that are struggling balance sheet wise as well. So what do you do? Well, you, you, you go to what Ndabe said, you start focusing on impact funds as well. So you do that. You look to the private markets and you make sure you've got infrastructure funds, et cetera. So you do all that. But that doesn't take you away from the fact that within a very important economy, there is this huge impact on people uh, because of the carbon intensity situation. So what do we do? We engage, we use the stewardship tools and we try to improve uh, the situation in terms of making sure we can understand the strategy of SASL to reduce emissions over time and align its strategy with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And so that's what we've been doing. Uh, SASL has moved quite a bit from where it was there's been leadership change that uh, we were involved in engagement with. And the situation now we feel is um, far more hopeful. But there's a big test ahead. So there is a resolution going to the Sassel AGM. Uh, I think it's 20th of November. Last year, they just pushed the resolution aside and would not put it before shareholders. The test for the authenticity of SASL and the uh, change that's come through in the climate change report will be how they deal with this particular shareholder resolution. And I'm looking forward to seeing how they deal with that. Now, just to end on a positive, um, positive note in terms of collaboration, in South Africa, with this COVID uh, issue that's complicated everything and made everything more challenging, 
it was fantastic to see that Anglo Gold Ashanti, in terms of uh, its experience in um, West Africa uh, with the infectious diseases there, um, learned from it how important washing of hands was, sanitation, etc. Sasol has the chemical ability to produce sanitizer. So Sasol. Anglo Gold Ashanti, in terms of the containers that they'd used in West Africa, Sabania Still Water and a, um, a transport company got together to make sure sanitizer was delivered to government hospitals, taxi ranks, uh, to beyond the, the mining fence uh, of Anglo Gold Ashanti and Sabania Still Water. And that's a hope for the future. And perhaps we can get back to that little bit of hope just now. Well, thanks a lot, David. We'll be yeah, waiting for the 20th of November anxiously. And thank you for ending on a rather positive note. Um, so obviously, you know, we've been we've been focusing on the on, on, on Africa um, so far, but energy systems are, are changing worldwide. And we're very pleased to have um, you, Mache. Um, and if you could share with us maybe your experience um, in Poland, and if you could draw some parallels between that experience and, and the conversation we've been we've been having thus far. Of course, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, Poland is maybe a good example, especially for South Africa, because Poland is a coal country. So still 80% of the electricity in the country is produced out of coal, both hard coal and, and lignite. Um, it's called rich country, so the mining sector used to be very, very strong uh, because it was established 200 years ago, at the verge of the industrialization, and then it developed and created a certain culture even locally in, in Silesia region especially. Um, and then uh, 30 years ago, after the fall of communism, Poland was more or less on the level of economic development as South Africa is today. So something like ten, eleven thousand dollars in GDP per in PPP terms, um, with very, very large coal sector employing uh, seven hundred thousand people or something like that, uh, with coal export, which was uh, uh, an extremely important part of the export uh, at the time, at least. And there, there was a challenge, yes, and uh, what to do with it. And uh, because at, this, at the same time, the, the, the working conditions were terrible, the, uh, the, the, the health issues, of course, many catastrophes and, and among the miners, and, uh, the environmental disasters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, changing parities, of course, uh, in, in terms of prices, which made, uh, for instance, coal export unattractive. Uh, at least for Poland, and this, and thereafter, that came the climate policy decarbonization, and uh, so this was a challenge. And Poland still is a coal country of uh, relatively large, so all this uh, almost 100% of coal which is consumed in, in country borders is produced within the country borders. Uh, but employment is much smaller than it used to be uh, 30 years ago, so it's never. 700,000 people, it's rather 70,000, know, yeah, so it's shrunk by the factor of 10. Uh, so, of course, it was huge restructuring uh, and very painful restructuring, especially in the 1990s when the economy was still not a uh, not rich economy, uh, putting it bluntly, yes. And so, uh, economic development really helped, yes. Yeah. So, um, what happened, for instance, in Silesia, was uh, reindustrialization or industrialization in a new style that allowed people to leave mining and then enter different fields. It was, of course, not a perfect process. So certain cities and uh, mining cities that uh, uh, faced uh, the, the need to economic foreclosures of mines uh, did very, relatively well because other types of factories were built there. But the others, maybe 30 kilometers away, not. Yeah? So with uh, the unemployment soared to 40% uh, around the, the, the year 2000. Yeah? So this was a really painful, uh, hard process uh, uh, that required uh, involvement of the government. And uh, huge uh, money was provided by the government to 
mitigate the, 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 this, uh, the, the problems in Silesia. Uh, also to develop the, 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 the local economy and to support the development of the economy, although it is still not perfect. So still there is a struggle of the, for instance, the environmental disaster, because after 200 years of uh, mining, uh, you know, the, 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 the ground is less Swiss cheese, yeah? so it's full of holes, there are civil catastrophes on, on ground, which is not perfect for investors, especially in certain towns. So simply investors don't want to go there. Yes? And in other places, yes, so revitalization is, uh, is a huge issue, which, uh, which for sure with the just transition coming in the next 10, 20 years in the other countries, we'll see the same. Yes, uh, so the, the, the same problem, how to attract investors in other parts of the economy, specifically in the manufacturing sector. And at the same time, how to attract them to the same places when the mines existed. Or if not, how to move the labor force, how to move people, how to allow them to, to work in somewhere else especially when you face huge unemployment and uh, people are not seeing many opportunities. So I think that, uh, that, that, that opening this and that accepting the decline of the mining sector is probably the first step. Uh, so especially in the first half of the, the, the 1990s, Poland didn't accept the decline and uh, the huge money were poured into the industry without any economic effect. And later on, the, 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 this mood has changed and, and, and rather money were tried directed towards in the industrialization, the cushioning, the layoffs in, 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 in the sector, not only the mining sector, but also steel works yeah, that were also associated. But the challenges are still ahead because, you know, because of the presence of, of hard coal in Silesia, which is very localized in Poland, also something like 70% of electricity generation is there. Yeah, so uh, actually entire electricity system is organized around Silesia, which of course, when, when, when we're thinking about the electricity or the power sector in the future, that's 15 years from now, 20 years from now, is very different. Yes, so it won't be in Silesia. The same can be said about the steel sector, which is now in the decline from, 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 from other reasons. Uh, so, um, so the government is still talking a lot and, and is talking to miners, talking to local, uh, local authorities, how to allow just transition to happen, uh, despite the fact that, that it already happened in, in, in let's say, in 70%. Especially that, that a lot of this industrialization that happened in Poland was, was also some, 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 somehow associated to the industry that will struggle with their own transformation in the next 20 years, uh, specifically the, the automotive industry. Now Poland is uh, in Europe became kind of a power powerhouse in, in, in automotive industry and maybe not in producing cars, but rather the, 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 the spare parts and the components from the, from, for the automotive industry, like engines, like, like other stuff that will probably disappear right now. It's what to do with it. And these are the challenges that, that, that have to be faced and that they, they, they will never stop probably in the next 30, forthcoming 30 years or so. So uh, the diversification of the industrial base is, uh, is of course, a, a nightmare uh, to, right now. But it used to be rather how to attract any investment. Yeah? So this is, this is, a, this is a process. Yeah? So, mm, uh, so I think that without a broad industrial strategy, there's also involves the financing, involves the creating a favorable business environment for the for other branches of the economy to, to, to invest. Just transition is very hard. Uh, a transition is very hard, not mentioning just transition. Uh, um, and to make it possible that some stable regulatory env uh, environment is, is, is really uh, a must. So a commitment of the government, the government, central government or local government, and really above, understand that, that the transition must happen and that they provide uh, a framework to do this. And uh, let's say the signal for, for the industry, the signal for the miners, the signal for the, for the, for the local workers and the engineers and the, and, and the others is that 
the future will be different and people have to adjust and the government provides equipment, regulatory money and uh, infrastructure, etc., cetera, to, to, to make it happen. And then the cooperation with the business uh, and the financial sector is incredibly important. Uh, we still have a larking problem in, in the banking sector, what to do with the stranded assets yes, that, that used to be financed and are financed by the banking sector. And it would, can, may affect the, 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 the balance sheet. So, uh, so this is really an overarching problem. And uh, without this commitment and without everyday work, it is very hard to overcome. And I wouldn't say Poland did it in an ideal way. Yes, so we used to have 40% of unemployment. We used to have emigration. Yes, from from Silesia that really shrunk, although it's still very still is very heavily populated. We still have many problems of poverty, of deteriorated infrastructure, etc. Although it's much better. So, however, it's much better because the economic growth was pretty strong. Yeah, so a Polish economy in terms of GDP per capita and GDP tripled over the last thirty years. Yes, so it was, of course much easier if you have strong economic growth, despite the fact that transition is, is, was going on. Um, so I think that for, for many African nations that, that witnessed pretty strong economic growth in the last 10 years, sustaining this growth yes, and, and having this growth for the next 30 years, 50 years, which, and becoming industrialized countries, at the same time having a transition, uh, with respect to coal, to, to, to coal mining, to coal, to coal generation, to, to oil sector, to gas sector. It's a challenge, but this is not a challenge that cannot be done. But it cannot be done without overarching policy and overarching effort. So it cannot be effort focused solely on the, on the mining sector or on the oil sector. It must be much more broad. Thanks very much, Mashe, for, for sharing your perspective and uh, yeah, for making such a compelling case for the need for more, more policy and yeah, more holistic um, uptake. Jesse, I would like you to I'd like to give you the opportunity to just react uh, quickly to what Mashe was just saying because I've seen you nodding a lot and I know that um, you could maybe provide a bit of uh, a bit of light around what what is the policy uh, setting around this transition at the moment. Thanks. Th thanks to all the other speakers as well. I mean, this has been very interesting. I, I want to just flag a few things which I think maybe pe people on the on the webinar will find interesting. The Climate Policy Initiative undertook an analysis of transition risk for South Africa. And I think it's actually something we haven't discussed very much when we start getting into the meat of this, right, in a particular sector like coal. Um, or you look at countries around the world. Every coal exporting country wants to grow its exports but nobody wants to buy their coal. So we're looking at a stagnant at best over the next 10 years and then quite rapidly declining seaborne market for coal. And that's not within the control of governments. And some of these sort of energy transition dynamics, like if someone wants to buy your internal combustion engine automotives are, are not something we can control. What we can control is how you make the processes around those transitions just. That's what's that's what's just about the just transition, right? It's not just transition. Um, and I think that's really important. So it's about process and it's about distributive justice. South Africa, I think, is actually doing really well in this regard compared to other parts of the world where it's only emerging or where it hasn't really been discussed very much at all yet. Um, we've had a high level political process that has concluded one, that we needed a just transition and that we needed to focus on hotspots where impacts were being felt first. So one of those hotspots is in Pumalanga, the other one is the free state around um, the, uh, the drought and people's inability to, to, to kind of manage the physical impacts of climate change. And that process, from that process also emerged a commitment from stakeholders, um, all social partners, that we should start looking at how to do this in a net zero way. Um, the government is in the, in the process of setting up our Presidential Coordinating Commission on Climate Change. Um, and there's things happening kind of in the regions around green economy development that, that makes me think actually South Africa is starting to really take these, these challenges seriously. One of the problems is now what do we do? 
um, now we're everyone's alert and worried and thinking about this problem. Uh, and and of course, we don't have a very good information base either, right? So people, some people say, oh, we've got 200,000 coal workers. Some people say we've got 500,000 uh, people who depend on coal mining. We don't even really have good good idea of how big some of these impacts are in some sectors. Um, so we need to do that. We need to focus on understanding the labor market very well and understanding the value chains of different sectors. And TIPS have been working on this in, in, in different ways over the last few months. But one of the things we've seen happen in other countries is that if you don't actually set a phase down schedule, if you don't say this is what it looks like, you don't create more certainty, you create less certainty and more political conflict and more worry and concern and upset about what's going to happen. Um, so one of the things is to keep bearing in mind is that there's also a climate element to this. I'm sorry, you can hear the chickens crowing maybe. <laughs> <laughs> food security um we need to actually commit to those phase down dates um and then start thinking about how to manage the process in a way that's fair for people um and you know a lot of this can happen because we're very concentrated in escom and sassel in south africa it can happen in those firms but it also needs to be bigger escom themselves are not big enough to manage this transition from Pomalanga. Uh, and Pomalanga province themselves are probably not big enough to manage it for themselves. This has to be a national strategy that that takes cognizance of these issues. And there's interesting financial ways of doing this, right? I mean, we've had really interesting proposals raised in South Africa around um, how to support ESCOM's uh, current debt problems in a way that can also start to support just transition projects in the regions. Um, and so starting to think kind of about these more interesting transition finance type models is, is maybe something that the finance sector, that can be their contribution to this. You can be stewards, you can manage process, you can encourage ESG, and you can also think about innovative finance models. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jesse. And maybe going to, to you and Devin, David, um, how do you how do you see yourself as a investor in this in this nexus? And how do you interact with other stakeholders, be it the governments? We've talking, you know, about we've talked about how you engage with companies, but how do you see your place um, as investors in engaging with policymakers and, and other stakeholders, including you know, workers um, and communities on, on these issues? Maybe and David to start, and then David. Um, yes, I, I think it's important to uh, focus on what uh, can be done, um, especially um, when it comes to uh, to impact investing. Um, we believe that it's going to result when implemented well, especially in the areas of real assets and infrastructure. It can result in job creating growth. And we need uh, job creation so that we can be in a position to deal with um, uh, all those pollution things uh, that if they were just done um, uh, ahead of time, uh, it might uh, uh, affect um, the unemployment rate. Um, so in how those projects are being done, we need to have local content because to be just doing renewable energy when we import everything from a, a very um, well-meaning uh, and rich Scandinavian country, um, but you're not doing anything in South Africa uh, or in other African countries, um, it will not result in uh, job creation. So we need to be deliberate uh, about um, how we're implementing our renewable energy projects, uh, ensuring that there's local content, ensuring that uh, the, the local people are, are also being uh, employed. Uh, we need to be deliberate about our focus on education. Um, indeed, someone once said uh, the Stone Age uh, did not end for the lack of stones. Uh, there was just uh, the, the you know development of uh, uh, the Iron Age. So as we move to renewable energy, we need to have people trained in new skills um, uh, so that they can be participants in, in the knowledge economy. Um, it, agriculture is good, but uh, we need more Africans employed um, uh, in the knowledge uh, sector of, of, of the economy. So ensuring that there's money being moved into those uh, into those sectors is important um, and holding those companies accountable to see how much they're putting in, in, in R&D um, research and development in supporting bursaries and 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 and, and all those uh, uh, institutions um, of uh, private but affordable high quality education is important 
Um, so we have incorporated not just ESG, but also impact investing um, and uh, uh, seeking to build back better. We have formed a, a, an asset owners uh, forum uh, in South Africa, uh, which, which has um, um, the top 20 uh, largest pension funds and more um, in South Africa, uh, so that we will be deliberate and coordinated in how we're investing um, in, in real assets to drive indeed economic recovery, as well as um, to take care of, uh, of job creation. I believe embedding all of those things in there is going to be important so that we have a united uh, response. And whatever uh, learnings that we have as a pension fund, we can share with other pension funds about uh, being deliberate about putting things on their investment policy statements, about holding asset managers accountable, um, about voting um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, uh, AGMs and proxy voting. I think if we do all of that and, and uh, are able to hear, to get the, the ear of government, we will be able to progress um, in, in this vein in a more deliberate and um, coordinated manner. So thank you, Nabla. And um, Jesse, yes, it's, it's really pleasing to see those plans starting to come together. Um, and Darby, the fact that the 20 largest asset owners are starting to work together, that's really great news. Remember, all you need to do is turn up the volume. Investment managers will respond because we're here to manage client money. So if you clearly state that you want impact funds, the investment managers will um, tend to uh, reallocate or ensure that there are products in that particular space. But let's just go back a little bit. I talked about collaboration and I think it's it's going to be really important going forward. And I was talking about it um, in terms of the asset owners. I think we've got to think globally. We've got one planet. It's a closed system. And there are a whole lot of integrated systems that are impacting people and planet. And those impacts will impact the sustainability of the returns that the investment industry can generate. So this is absolutely critical that we move away from the micro fiddling around to understanding the global system and where it really matters and what we in the industry can do but what other actors need to be involved? Jesse's talking about the plans of government. We have many plans, you know, from a government point of view, but it's the action, the implementation, the outcomes. And so Jesse touched on some of the interesting uh, creative financial um, structures that are being considered with regard to ESCOM, et cetera. And there's one that I think is really interesting. And uh, if the global actors could ensure that this actually happens. Remember, there is probably about 100 billion US dollars that the um, developed countries were supposed to be allocating to the developing countries to deal with climate change from 2020 onwards. If some of that, let's call it climate finance, could come into um, reducing or removing the debt of ESCOM, and at the same time create a fund that focus on the, the people in terms of the just transition, it could make a huge difference in our country. It could take this massive debt burden off the backs of the state-owned entity or this particular state-owned entity. And if it's successful, that type of transaction with the sophisticated banks and financial institutions in South Africa could be replicated perhaps elsewhere in Africa. So we need that. So who, who can lead this? Well, sometimes governments are a little bit distracted. But 
The PRI has grown up. It's come a long way. I think it's been going for 14 or 15 years. And what I'm really looking forward to is when you reach 21, your maturity, which would be about 2026, 20, 2027, 20, I'm not sure. But if you could look back at that point and say that we focused on the right things, the material issues that made a difference to people and planet at a macro level, and the world is now well positioned to, to deliver on the SDGs, then I think the PRI can say that we've grown up and we've focused on the right things. And I'd like the organization to think of that and to think that in Africa, there is a massive opportunity to make a huge difference. Think materiality in terms of people first. Think of materiality in terms of the missions that could be um, mitigated and dealt with here in Africa, in South Africa, and how that could spread to the rest of um, the um, African continent. And if we just go back quickly uh, to um, the five degree, sorry, <laughs> the one and a half degree uh, report. I mean, it's quite frightening. Everything is on average and South Africa could go from five to eight degrees um, increase in temperature. But if we just go back to that IPCC report and they ended with, we cannot waste a moment more. We cannot waste any more carbon. We cannot waste another year and we cannot waste any more decisions. And that's why it's so important that we look at the macro level and we deal with these issues in a focused way that matters. Well, thanks a lot, David. And a strong call to action for, for the PRI as well that we take very seriously. And it's, it's very timely as we're um, also releasing our human rights framework today, um, raising, you know, raising the standards for our signatories um, on human rights. So hopefully we can, we can have a, another conversation in five years time and have made a, a lot of progress by, by then. Um, we don't have much time left, so I'd, I'd like to ask maybe uh, Mache and Jesse if you had um, a call uh, to investors on, on the Just Transition agenda, um, what would it be? And maybe starting with you, Mache. Uh, well, just first of all, first of all, talk to the governments yes, and try to uh, produce together or construct together a coherent framework. Yes, in, in the EU, in the European Union, we, we have such a coherent framework from around the transition issue. Yes, it, it is called taxonomy for uh, sustainable finance. And uh, uh, this, because this transition will affect not only the the real economy, the mining sector, the power sector, the industry, but also the financial sector, which financed this the, 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 this real economy for many many years. And uh, in Poland, we had problems with uh, with the financial sector, with the banking sector in the 1990s, with the stability of it, and it had to be restructured along the side, along uh, along the, 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 the industry. And it, it, so the the, the this restructuring may be an issue, uh, especially in, in a country like, for instance, South Africa. Uh, so the assistance even of the central bank and the assistance of the international institutions like the International Monetary Fund. And uh, so uh, look on it and then, but, but, but be committed and have a standard, yes? And maybe agreeing on importing a standard from, from European Union that, that work on that a lot and that embed a lot of human capital in it, yes, and, and, and prepared tools like uh, like taxonomy, like just transition fund, may, might be a good idea. Well, a Polish example is that by mimicking, by following the steps and learning from, from, from the others, this is a, a very efficient way to, 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 to catch up. And uh, there, however, also the help of more developed nations. I believe it is a duty and it must be negotiated. And I hope that after the Paris Agreement and 
that the climate talks there are still going on, this type of facilities will, will be organized, especially even after the COVID crisis, when, when we have, uh, let's say, you know, quantitative easing plus, 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 and uh, worldwide, and the, 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 the talks about green finance and the greening of this, the, this money flows is, is, is really advanced. And, and therefore, this is the, 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 this might be a future, but it will not be used in the proper way for the just transition of developing countries if they are not prepared. Yes, if they don't work the lessons within the borders. Yes, and th this is hard. Yes, so you have to involve in the talk with uh, avoid, for instance, social distrust and uh, uh, say uh, mutinies and huge demonstrations, violence. It happened. It was limited in Poland, but it happened yes, because this, this this is so hard. So gaining trust of, of the of the partners, social partners, the the, the miners, the, the unions, the, of the industrial partners, of the of the financial sector, of the uh, of of public officials, and finding this common denominator between them is extremely important. And this is a process that will take five years, ten years, but it must be done. That without this work, nothing will happen. Thank you, Masha. Uh, yeah, Jesse, go ahead. Um, so I, I have two ideas, um, and and they're related to, to what has been happening locally in South Africa, but I think they probably apply to other countries a little bit as well. So my, I have uh, this is a, a call to arms for investors. So so one, I think, uh, please allow companies to be innovative and brave. Uh, we have a local mining company who have been wanting to think about diversifying out of coal for many years and have been punished by, by shareholders for that. Um, they, it's not, it wasn't supported when they announced that they wanted to start what, what is you know, their future, their business of tomorrow. Um, and, and I think that's a shame because, because you're isolating that innovation that people might have around reimagining themselves as something different. And two, I wanna, I wanna say, can investors start to think about responsible closure of fossil fuel assets? Um, divestment has obviously been an incredibly important uh, impetus to, to, to getting investors and getting companies to move and think about their futures. But we're a very small place here. Uh, just divestment leaves us with, uh, for example, like what's happening in the coal sector where the major mining companies are just selling their assets and getting out of South Africa, right? Um, so the companies who are the most equipped, they have the most access to capital, they have experience doing this elsewhere, are, are, are selling these assets to much smaller local companies and getting out. Um, and I see a lot of risk around that, whereas I think committing to responsible closure and responsible phase out is would be something incredibly profound. Instead of saying, oh, we've sold our mind, it's not our problem anymore, to say we're the best in the world at social planning, at transition planning, at social closure, we have world-class environmental rehabilitation capabilities. Um, so we're gonna see these assets to the end of their lives. We've mined here for a hundred years and, and that's that's what we're gonna do as, as responsible investors and as responsible companies. And I, I think that it's a fundamental mind shift. Um, and I think it would really change things for people on the ground um, and companies as well on the ground. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Jesse, and, and great to end on these on these two call to arms. Um, I wish we had more time today because we've we've touched on uh, a number of topics that it would have been great to to dig deeper into. But I want to thank you, uh, the four of you, for your excellent contributions and for agreeing to be part of this panel today. I want to thank our audience uh, for being with us, and I look forward to continuing the the conversation with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care.